So uh, I just want to start by welcoming everyone um, and thank you for being here this afternoon for this masterclass, uh, Burma and Human Rights Imagery from Portraits to Satellites. My name is Andrea Hawley. I'm the strategic director of the Human Rights Watch Film Festival. So it's a pleasure to be here uh, back at Dibali. And I do just want to take a moment to thank everyone here at Dibali. I have a feeling many of you have been to this cinema before, so I just want to thank all the staff here at Dibali for their help. And I also just want to quickly thank, you'll see in the brochure, all the sponsors and supporters of the Human Rights Weekend. Um, to get started, I think many of you have seen in the brochure, today's program, I just want to give a brief introduction and then I'm going to introduce our speakers. The idea of today's program is that we've taken Burma and the Rohingya crisis as a case study of how Human Rights Watch uses imagery, in particular satellite images and portraits, to put together um, the kind of reporting that complements our traditional reporting, where investigations, witness testimony, and similar sorts of uh, documentation are used to publish reports and shorter documents online. So we want to take a moment to focus on these two types of imagery and how they are used in conjunction with the rest of our Human Rights Watch methodology to go at a case that is unfolding in real time. And we'll speak a little bit about that, just that it's an ongoing situation, as many of you probably know. Um, I'm going to take a brief moment just to say a few words about Human Rights Watch's methodology. Human Rights Watch traditionally works through a methodology that involves investigating, exposing, and then change. And what we mean by that is investigate means missions in the field, on the ground, at the borders, etc., in the villages that we can access. Expose has to do with how we publish and disseminate the information. That means both text and visuals. And then change relates specifically to advocacy be that meetings with UN officials or government officials, be that talking to the public or fellow NGOs. It's all about how do we establish some methodology to create change or movement on this issue, which as you might imagine, is not always simple. So by way of that, I'm gonna introduce our speakers um, and each of them are gonna say a few words about the story that we're gonna to tell today. So directly to my left, I have my colleague, Akshaya Kumar, who's the Deputy United Nations Director at Human Rights Watch, where she is responsible for conducting advocacy with members of the General Assembly and the Security Council and other UN organs and agencies. Previously, she was Sudan and South Sudan policy analyst at the Enough Project, where she helped launch the Century a project that aims to dismantle the financing of Africa's deadliest conflicts. She has served as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center and law fellow with the Public International Law and Policy Group. She holds a law degree from Columbia University, a Master of Law and Human Rights, Conflict and Justice from SOAS, and a bachelor's degree from George Washington. So thank you for joining us, Akshaya, very impressive. Anastasia taylor Lind worked with us on this particular case. She's a freelance photojournalist who has been working for leading editorial publications all over the world on issues relating to women, population, and war for the last 15 years. She's a 2016 Harvard Nieman Fellow and recently finished a year of research at the University on War and How We Tell Stories About Modern Conflict. She is currently working on a book about the visual representation of contemporary warfare and the photojournalists who cover it. She is also a National Geographic contributor, and this is the first time that she has worked with Human Rights Watch. So thank you so much for being here. And last but not least, my colleague Josh Lyons, who conducts satellite imagery analysis to support the investigations Human Rights Watch does in a wide range of countries. I could go through a whole list, but I have a feeling we will touch on many of those during the conversation. Burma is just one of many recent conflicts and current conflicts that Josh has worked on. Before joining Human Rights Watch in 2012, Josh was principal analyst of the United Nations Operational Satellite Applications Program, responsible for the overall research, development, and production of satellite-based reports in support of humanitarian operations during natural disasters and armed conflicts. Josh has directly contributed to a number of international investigations, including the Goldstone Report in 2009, the Security General Panels of Experts Report on Sri Lanka in 2011, and the UN's Commission of Inquiry Report on Syria. 
He holds a master's degree in international relations from LSE, the London School of Economics, and geographic information science from the University College London. Thank you, Josh, for being here as well. So, just to set a little bit of context, I'm gonna ask each of our speakers to share a little bit about their piece of the puzzle, and then we'll go into the investigate chapter. And I'm gonna take questions throughout, so if you have a question, and I'll let you know when it's time for questions, we'll have a long amount of time for questions at the end. Please raise your hand, and we have a microphone we'll bring to you. But for starters, I'll begin with Josh. Um, could you just frame for the audience a little bit about the tools and technology that are behind the images they're going to see today? Mm -hmm. Just briefly, to sort of help people understand what we're talking about. Well, what I thought I'd, I'd do is walk you through a series of maps and satellite images, basically in, um, present them in chronological order as we collected them during the course of that investigation. And some of these images are, are black and white, and some of them are in color. And these were all taken from commercial satellites and environmental and scientific satellite sensors. So before you start, I'm just going to ask Akshaya to do a little bit of a favor for us and lay out some of the basics of the Rohingya crisis and where we are right now, just so everyone, I realize there may be experts in the room. I realize there may be other people who just know a bit about this. So I just want to make sure we have the basics. And maybe you can just share a little bit about the case that we're working with at Human Rights Watch and what we have so far. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Andrea. So how many people here have heard about the Rohingya community uh, before today's event? Okay, so it seems like uh, most people have a sense of what's going on. So the Rohingya community are um, frequently referred to as the most persecuted or marginalized community in the world. Um, some people call them stateless, uh, but from our perspective at Human Rights Watch, they've actually been forced into the position of being without a state. Um, but more than that, they've been forced into a position of being without their homes. Um, and many people have not just lost their homes, but also um, their family members. Uh, and this comes in the context of years of systematic discrimination. The Rohingya live in the southeastern part of Myanmar in a state called Rakhine. Uh, where they're an ethnic minority group. And they're also Muslim, whereas most of the people in Burma or Myanmar are Buddhist. Uh, and, and that creates a tension because for some people, the Buddhist character of the country is really important. And so the potential for this Muslim community, which has um, allegedly a high birth rate, has been framed as some sort of an existential threat. Uh, that then was combined and exacerbated by the emergence of an armed movement on behalf of the Rohingya community who were protesting against the discrimination and attacking security services who were part of repressing them in the past. And that real emergence of the group has shifted the dynamic from a long-term slow burn situation of discrimination, um, maybe even an apartheid, to where we are now, which is an active ethnic cleansing, uh, where this group is being persecuted and targeted for the color of their skin, for their faith, for the god they worship, um, and for the threat that they're seen as. Uh, and they're being treated um, as a threat on the whole, uh, which is something under international law that's deeply problematic, because we uh, have a principle that you distinguish between civilians, people who aren't fighters, um, kids, women, people who are not threats, and then actual members of an armed group. Uh, and that's really the root cause of the human rights concern into what's happened to the Rohingya community. Uh, now, uh, over a million people who are Rohingya are living in Bangladesh, and 680,000 of those people were displaced in just three months last year, which is a mass movement of population across a border, uh, creating a huge burden on Bangladesh, but also a huge gap in uh, Burma, where they used to live. And that gap is adeptly being filled by the Burmese government and people in Rakhine State who are now talking about ways to take over that land. Uh, and that's also part of our analysis as to why this is an ethnic cleansing. And I just want to say, I think we'll talk about this more later, that Akshaya was in the field on mission, and I think we'll reference that. But I do want to just use that to allow Anastasia to say a couple words about 
what her participation and role was, because you were also in the field. Maybe you can just say a few words before we pass back to Josh. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm a freelance photojournalist, and I was hired by Human Rights Watch to travel to Bangladesh for um, what turned out to be almost a month and work together with Akshaya and some of the other researchers on the ground um, to create imagery that could be used alongside um, the reports that they were um, creating. So um, it's pretty unusual as a photojournalist to be given free creative reign as it, as it is, but um, my assignment was simply to travel with the team and to respond um, photographically in some way to what I was seeing. So uh, considering that um, there were a lot of other photojournalists working in Kutupalong camp at that time and creating um, very strong and widely published work um, in a, a traditional photojournalistic way, if you like. Um, I ended up arriving at the conclusion that I would make a series of portraits of the individuals who had been interviewed by members of our team mm -hmm. and given eyewitness testimonies. Um, and it was also uh, as a result of my um, line of inquiry um, at Harvard, um, I, I had just, this is, these are actually the first photographs really that I've taken in two years because I was away from the field and from photographing and only writing for that time. Uh, so I was thinking a lot about how we represent uh, people, people who have um, experienced war and conflict and um, how traditionally in photojournalism, the way we represent them is inherently different to the way we would photograph ourselves. Um, and so I tried to um, photograph the, the people that I met in the same way I might photograph my mom, someone in my family, um, if uh, somebody, one of you asked me for an, art, you know, a, an artist's portrait, an author's portrait, um, just kind of um, quite normally, if you like, rather than um, focusing on uh, the moments, and of course they exist, uh, when these people were at their most desperate um, and most, um, yeah, and their most desperate. There's a lot to say about it, but um, I will show you the pictures <laughs> also. Thank you. So I'm going to give it back to Josh, and I just want to say for everyone, you know, sort of the key questions or key points that we've been talking about in creating this program for you um, look at both emphasizing what the puzzle, I'm going to say puzzle, but how we put together the story or the narrative. And at times, and Josh will walk us through the imagery with the satellites, mm -hmm. there are questions, what triggered? We need a certain image to corroborate something, or sometimes it goes in the other direction. We have this image and the satellite map, and, and we need it to match up with what we're finding on the ground. And so sometimes there are problems or things to understand and we have conflicts so I think you know Josh will speak to that and Josh will also speak to what might seem like rather um, boring details about what the weather's like one day when you're trying to get certain imagery so let me give it to Josh to explain more about that sure well I should I should preface this, um, the, the the imagery I mean, all of the things that we're showing and sharing with you today um, really are framed in the context of, of this attack that happened in Rakhine State on the 25th of, of August last year. And that's really where the story begins. And, and I was re reflecting on this. Um, the, the first thing, I had two things that went through my mind when I first heard this report. Um, that, that there had been this wide-scale um, wide um, and apparently coordinated attack against military positions in Rakhine State. And the first and most obvious thought that passed through my mind was that this is, this is going to um, be a catastrophe. Um, knowing what we know based on the previous experience and the previous research is that any provocation, any sign of resistance um, will almost certainly be met with an overwhelming and violent response by, by the, the Burmese government, by the Burmese military. That is, that is exactly how they've always operated. And 
and immediately following that thought about this seemingly inevitable catastrophe was something a little bit more prosaic that I'm certain I was probably the only person who thought about it, which was, I wonder what the weather is going to be in Rakhine State. Um, as, a, as, as really the only investigator in Human Rights Watch who doesn't travel, um, all of my work is done sitting at my desk in, in Geneva. And as a remote sensing expert, my research is conducted with essentially digital photography recorded from space. And when there's clouds, it, it essentially means I can't do my work. And um, the, then the sort of the, the more uh, superficial professional fears kick in. And I'm, now I'm worried and I'm anticipating I'm going to get an email and then two emails and then three emails and my phone is going to start to ring in a few hours on through the course of that day by colleagues both in and outside of, of Human Rights Watch begging for the satellite imagery to get a first look, to get an initial impression about what the dynamic is on the ground and is it really as bad as we all fear. And that, that immediately led into a very detailed review of the weather, looking at um, you know, climate uh, and environmental satellites to see, indeed, it was exactly as I feared. This was, this was smack dab in the, the tail end of the monsoon season, which means more or less Burma and, and Bangladesh are covered in very deep cloud and rain. And then my thought immediately goes into basically sort of trying to manage everyone's expectations and let everyone know up front that I'm really not going to be able to do much. And then it led into a process of trying to basically task these commercial satellites to go ahead anyway and start taking images over the affected areas as we understood um, in anticipation that maybe we might get lucky. But the, the problem with this is that most of these commercial satellites have already been, they've been over-engineered actually to not even function when the weather forecast is bad. Uh, it's quite, it's, you know, it's entirely commercially driven. And you have to pay a huge amount of money to uplift the images to force them to take a picture of beautiful clouds. And, and for the most part, it's, no one wants those, those images of clouds and they're very hard to sell. And then that means they're very hard to actually acquire because no one's even collecting that imagery. And so the first step we did was to look at something that we would normally not look at, which are environmental images taken from a very different type of, of satellite constellation. And, and these are really designed for um, broad continental scale monitoring of weather, of climate, of, of deforestation, of major natural disasters. But there is something very unique and exotic about this type of technology, which is it also is capable of detecting forest fires. And we know from previous experiences that in certain circumstances, the, the, the violent act of, of burning a village can be detected from space. The image itself doesn't show anything. It's just a saturated pixel, okay? It's just a bright spot. But when you combine that with the, the mapping databases that we have, then you can infer that the village is, is, is most likely on fire. And that gives you a very, very concrete and conclusive evidence of the exact time and the duration and the, the, the spatial distribution of, of, this, of this occurrence, of this violent attack. And when we first ordered this data, it actually doesn't come as an image. It really just comes as an Excel file. It comes as a text file. And I was expecting nothing because this is the monsoon season. And the chances that it would be able to detect fire through cloud is, is very, very small. And that text file, was, it was shocking. It was a long list, latitude, longitude, date, time, and the confidence interval. And each one of these records represents a village on fire burning at that exact moment in time. And when we combine these, this Excel sheet, these saturated pixels, and overlay that with the, the, the village databases that we have, it became painfully obvious that 
each one of these fires was a village. And it wasn't just a building on fire. It was almost certainly the entire village was on fire. And that was the only way to explain how it could have been that this thermal energy could have penetrated the clouds and, and have been recorded by these satellites that were never intended for this type of, of purpose. And it confirmed all of our worst fears, basically, that, that this, was, this was as bad and, as, and worse than we, than we expected. Um, Can you ahead. clarify one small thing sure. on this image, Josh? Um, I think people have a good sense of the, the geography and the spatial logic. Yeah. Could you clarify for us the, what I will call chronology here? Were these all simultaneous? What's the time interval, or can you? So the, the, the fires, what, what we actually did, the, the first press release we made was based entirely on this Excel sheet. Um, and essentially what it showed was this, this widespread and sustained campaign of arson directed against Rohingya villages. Now we knew, we knew the, the villages because we could, we could interact and intersect these saturated pixels, these fires with the UN databases and then understand that the fires were occurring over, over, a, over an area of 100 square kilometers, uh, sorry, over a length of 100 kilometers and they were burning in multiple locations for, for prolonged periods of time. And that, and that formed the basis of the, the first independent and concrete evidence of a systematic campaign against the Rohingya population. The, the first images started to roll in during this agonizing two-week period. And the, the, the actual automated um, um, alerts that I would get would say, this image, this satellite, and it's 99% cloudy. And I had very little hope that actually this would, this would have produced anything. But we downloaded this massive image recorded basically over almost all of the Rakhine state. And then it was literally just the process of, of exploration, of discovery. I see a little break in the clouds. What's there? What can I see? And <clears throat> <clears throat> what you see here is a destroyed village that's just peaked just a sliver of that. It's not the whole village, but it's just enough to see that every single building has been destroyed. And we have not only first this first conclusive evidence of, of the building destruction, but we also have that timestamp, that environmental flag that gave the exact moment the fires began to burn in that village. And those red dots represent the initial damage assessment, the buildings that we've started to annotate. So that gives us a, quant a quantitative assessment of, of the number of buildings per village. Mm -hmm. And this one image, as I said, it was 99% cloudy. But for what we could see in that 1% was terrifying. It was village after village after village. And then the obvious question was, what are we not seeing? What's under the rest? What's under the 99%? What's under those clouds? And then, thankfully, the monsoon season comes, starts to, to come to an end and the clouds lift, and now a range of different satellites are taking images. And now, instead of just black and white, now it's, it's multispectral. Now it's, it's in natural color. And this is a typical workflow. So to do the assessment, you have an image before the event, and then an image immediately taken immediately after. And so this is a particular village, just one of, of dozens at this point that we had identified before. And this is how it looked after. OK? Every single building, virtually, it's, it's virtually 100% destruction. OK? And then when you see the scale of this, and you start counting it, and you see this over and over and over again, you start to think logistically, how much time would it have taken? How many people had to have been involved in this process? And and then as you start engaging with the imagery and you're exploring it and you're, 
you're trying to understand it visually, you start to find these strange anomalies where there's a destroyed village and an intact village immediately adjacent to it. What does that mean? What's the storyline? Um, is this a village about to be burned? Or is this a village where the perpetrators live and they've walked across the street? Many scenarios start to play out in your mind and you can't really adjudicate these. You can't really determine which one of these potential explanations is, is, is the accurate one without people on the ground. And at this moment, then, we're starting to get people there. We're starting to interview the people who are coming across the border. And that's when this magical fusion happens, when the ground testimony and the photographs and the evidence is then combined with what we can see from space to give it much more meaning and, and value. And just to set this thing up here, um, this is a hilltop in Bangladesh taken um, before the event. This is, oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, this is taken the 25th of May of, of the same year. And then three, three weeks after, that hilltop has been transformed into a city, a city of tens of thousands of, uh, of people. We can't see them. I can just count the buildings and I can imagine what's happening on the ground. But in the process of this discovery, we start to combine, combine all of these bits and pieces, the break in the cloud, the fire detection, and compile that into a list, basically, a list of destruction. So we're going to stop there, and before we shift into the portraits. I just want to offer people a chance. I can take a couple questions now. If people have questions immediately for Josh, there'll be time at the end as well. But I just want to give people an opportunity. If someone has a question now, feel free to raise your hand and we'll bring you the microphone. Yes, sir. Robin, sorry, do you mind? Andrew, you good? For anything? Okay. Maybe a question for later. My name is Gert-Jan van Dommelen. I'm from the town called Huizen, close to Amsterdam. Uh, I've been involved in working on Burma human rights since 1999 for mm. adoption cases. It's not my job, it's just free time voluntary work. Mm. But then at that time, and it has not changed, the uh, Burmese or Myanmar army was seen as the strongest army in the world with over one million soldiers, all coming as volunteers, you could say sold by their parents as 16, 15 year old boys from the north and east towards the Chinese border. And the whole family, so about 40% of the Burmese people live because their sons are in the army and they bring home food and shelter, etc. You can never destroy this army because they just hide, they're part of the population. They have a very strong opinion against the Rohingyas, not based on facts, just because everybody has a, a I say that, a, a, an opinion about them. What do you think is the cause of this? And do you have any ideas about how to fix this? Not getting the people back, but fixing it in Burma, where there's a reason why this happened. Okay. We That's see as they are yeah. human beings, but they don't see them as human beings. Right. That's a big question. It is a big question. I, I'm going to let, well, actually, I'm going to let, actually, and anybody who wants to answer, but I appreciate your question. But do you want to just maybe speak to that a little bit? And the military, I don't know anything, so please feel free. Uh, so you raised two really important points. One is that the Burmese military has for years played an outsized <laughs> role in society. And in fact, uh, the military controlled Burma for years and years and years. And uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, who many of you probably have heard of, was a celebrated icon. She was a political prisoner. She stood up against this military for its excesses, for its abuses against the population. And so that is one narrative of the situation in Burma, which is she was finally released from jail. There were elections 
elections, she was able to come into power. Her party, the National League of Democracy, the NLD, now has a majority in the parliament. And so there was this trajectory towards challenging the military's role. Uh, at the same time, as you said, the military have for a long time um, relied on otherizing certain communities, um, on emphasizing majority <coughs> nationality, the Bamar nationality, and specifically pushing aside uh, minority groups, ethnic groups uh, that um, could be painted as the enemy, but also more importantly could be painted as the threat. Uh, because one of the ways that the military retains its power and control is to make people feel like there's a threat against them from within, and that's why we need a strong military to protect us. And the Rohingya are a perfect example of that because they look different, they speak a different language. Uh, the popular, regular Burmese person actually calls them Bengali, which implies that they're from Bangladesh rather than even from the country, uh, and they're Muslim rather than uh, Buddhist. And I think that all of those dimensions play into the way that the Rohingya community in particular ends up being persecuted, but also exactly why the military in a dynamic like this um, retains a lot of power and influence. And I guess the last point to add is that even though Aung San Suu Kyi has come into power and has control over the civilian parts of the government, the military still remains incredibly powerful in Myanmar and uh, is largely responsible for the destruction that Josh has laid out here, destruction that we have concluded amounts to crimes against humanity, not just because of the arson, but because of what we found and I think what Anastasia can speak to, which is the brutality and the really intimate nature of the personal violence that these soldiers committed against these communities um, as a part of what they <coughs> called a counterinsurgency campaign. Uh, and they have a history of conducting counterinsurgency campaigns in other parts of the country too that is incredibly abusive. So this is not outside of their track record at all. And on top of all of that, no one's ever been prosecuted because they have absolute impunity. Uh, and so that's part of the problem. And you know, Josh's list of villages amounts to over 300 just in this short span of time. So I would say that it is probably the largest scale campaign that has been conducted by this military in recent years. And that's what makes it so remarkable um, that we're still in this position politically, and we'll talk about this at the end, uh, where people are not sure what to do uh, because you have this huge, human rights crisis, a humanitarian crisis, uh, ethnic cleansing, but then you also have this story of a nascent democratic transition. And how you balance those things goes exactly to your question, which is how do you solve this? I think we will need to discuss that uh, later in the panel. Yes, we'll definitely come back to that in the sort of idea about change and what we're advocating for. But I'm gonna pass it back to Anastasia to move on to the portraits and tell a little bit about some of the individuals you met and how you did the work there, taking into account the level of violence and some of the other things we found on that mission. In many ways, um, speaking about the sort of the, my workflow, the process of working as a photojournalist, um, I had a similar problem to overcome uh, as Josh in that um, how would I photograph something that I actually can't see myself? Um, I arrived in uh, Bangladesh in, I think, the, the second week in September. So the crimes that I had been sent to document had taken place several weeks before. And as a photojournalist, we can only really photograph things that happen if we are there when they happen. Um, and uh, actually crossing the border into Rakhine State is, is almost imp impossible. I mean, I think... There, I think there are a few journalists who've done it, but it's very, very risky. It's very dangerous um, to the people who, uh, to the journalists, but also to the people that they then document. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some opportunities to work on organized state tours inside Rakhine State, um, or propaganda tours, if you like. But really, um, there is no journalistic, there are no journalistic photographs of this violence actually being committed. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples, actually, of, of how these 
Um, these pictures don't sit alone. They sit next to very, very detailed first-person eyewitness testimonies um, that are conducted by the Human Rights Watch team. And in a way um, that's actually quite different to the way we, as journalists, would probably conduct interviews. Um, I, this is not a very technical term, but in, incredibly fastidious and um, also uh, being, you know, uh, the team had Josh's pictures on the ground with us on, on laptops and were actually using your images um, to identify locations as these people were being interviewed. Um, so the photographs were made to accompany several reports. Um, one was about the massacre at Tula Tolly. And I'm going to read to you some, some of the eyewitness um, testimonies. Uh, this is Rashida. She's 25, um, and she was among um, many people that we interviewed about what had taken place um, in Tula Tolly. Uh, I, this is in her voice. Um, the women and children were made to sit in the water. We women and children were more than 400 in the water. They took us away in groups of five women, five at a time, and there were more than 200 taken away by the time they took me. About half of the women and children remained in the water when they took me away. I don't know what happened to them. They brought five of us women to a room in a house. They tortured us with knives and rifle butts. I had my 28-day-old baby, Mohammed Ukan, on my chest, and when they hit me, the baby fell. They hit the baby, and later I found he was dead. They hit me in the neck and they cut my throat with a knife and then stabbed me in the stomach. The other four girls died in that room. They burned the room and they couldn't escape. When the fire started, I woke up and found my baby with his head swollen and he was no more. This is Fatima, she's 15 years old and she watched soldiers beat her 10 year old sister to death and then she was beaten unconscious. She also woke up in a burning house and managed to escape. This is Sahid Rahman. He survived a massacre at Chopran. Um, his sister was killed and his 12-year-old brother is still missing. This is Khadija Begum. Um, we've changed her name to protect her identity. She's also only 15. Her family members were caught by the Burmese military and shot while they tried to flee. She's one of the only surviving members of her family. <coughs> this is Mohammed Osman. This is Katiza Begum. Um, Katiza's three-month-old infant daughter was also killed in front of her. She was beaten unconscious and left in a house that was set on fire. Um, and this is Mohammed Al Hassan. He survived another massacre at Mangnu, and um, Human Rights Watch also um, detailed a report on what happened there. Let me tell you. You can see the um, the machete marks on his neck, and he was and, the, and these um, these bandages cover the bullet holes on his chest. He's 18. Um, actually, this is an example of how perhaps um, the text that accompanies photographs might be different um, in this context of um, the researchers at Human Rights Watch interviewing people. My background is as a photojournalist working for magazines. Um, so this was really my first time working as part of a team and collecting evidence in this way. Um, I'm reading from Rich Weir's report. Mohammed Hassan is 18. He said that a dozen soldiers, led by Staff Sergeant Bayou, took him and two male relatives, Mohammed Zobair and Foyas, from their house to Zahid Hussein's nearby courtyard. Hassan said, that when they got there, there were hundreds of men and boys tied up, he said, I'm quoting. Four soldiers took me and my relatives to the corner of the courtyard 
and shot us each twice in the back. I lost consciousness. When I woke up, I saw many men still tied and the soldiers were still killing people. Many were stabbed to death. When I tried to flee, I was shot in the chest but was able to escape. Mohammed Al showed Human Rights Watch his bullet wounds. He said that in addition to the two executed beside him, nearly 30 more male relatives were killed that day. This is Shafika. She's Rashida's sister, the, the first portrait you saw of the woman who'd had her throat cut. She also survived. And this is Karima Khatun. Um, she survived a massacre. Over there. Oh, thank you. Where am I supposed to? Which direction? I don't know if it really helps. I think. Oh, I think I've. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, Karima's two and a half year old son Mohammed Anas was wounded when an RPG landed in their courtyard. Mum, I've burning in my face, he said as she ran with him in her arms to a nearby paddy field to escape the Burmese army attack. There Mohammed and Karima were struck by the same bullet that tore through Mohammed's abdomen and into Karima's arm. She tried to bandage his torso with a scarf but Mohammed died as she held him. Karima lost eight family members that day her infant son, her husband, and her brother. And she's 21 years old. You can see the, the bullet wound on her arm. This is Mohammed Zubair. He's only 19. Um, and his grandfather, his sister, and two brothers were killed, and he was shot twice. Um, all of the names of relatives who'd been killed um, were collected by uh, the Human Rights Watch research researchers, um, led by Peter Bookhart, but there were four, four team members um, working in the field while I was making these portraits. And um, while these very long and detailed interviews were being conducted, um, I was setting up a very rudimentary makeshift studio with this piece of black fabric that I, um, that I bought in a... Um, a shop inside um, Kutupalong refugee camp. So I was working, um, making pictures that would look like they'd been made in a traditional portrait studio, but using very rudimentary um, props. The, this piece of black fabric, sometimes the black tarpaulin or um, borrowing clothes that were hanging to dry on someone's washing line, and then working with an assistant who held a gold reflector to bounce the light from a, a natural light source, so from a window or holding the door open to one of the makeshift huts that we were working in. Um, this is Rajuma Begum, and um, I'm also going to reference one more time the report um, and a little bit of her story. This is only half of the report. Um, I couldn't manage any more in my lap, but it's very, very detailed. And um, it, this is the Tula Tolly report, and um, it amalgamates in um, actually a narrative way as well as a documentary, um, you know, as well as a, an evidence-based way, um, the stories and um, pieces together um, what happened in Tula Tolly on that day. Um, so uh, I will read from the report again. Um, Rajuma Begum said that soldiers took her from the group of women standing in the water to a three-room bamboo house nearby, together with her mother-in-law and infant son. She said, In our group, there were three women with children, one young girl and an older woman. Between seven and ten soldiers took us to a room in the house. There were other women in other rooms in the house, as we could hear them. I could hear women and girls screaming from the other rooms. She said they grabbed her 16-month-old toddler, Mohammed Sadiq. They first took my child and threw him down on the ground. He was still alive then, and I had to watch as they slaughtered him. 
the children of the other two women were killed in the same way, thrown to the ground and killed with machetes. They were both boys, about five and seven. A few minutes later, they took the bodies of the children and threw them on the fire outside. <coughs> This is Abdus Salam. He is 15 years old and the only surviving member of his family. And Mohammed Ayas, um, he is also the only surviving member of his family and he's 16 years old. You can see the bullet, a hole on his chest. Um, this is Shamina. Uh, she's 25, and she gave birth to her daughter, Sharman, who she's holding here um, in the forest after fleeing a Burmese army attack on her village, uh, Tang Bazaar. Uh, when her waters broke, um, she'd been walking for four days already, and she'd not eaten anything, hadn't drunk anything, and she labored all night alone, occasionally attended to by another fleeing woman who helped her and um, who used a thorn from a forest cane to cut the umbilical cord um, when Shaman was delivered. And after, once she gave birth, it took them another <coughs> 10 days to reach uh, bang the Bangladeshi border. This is Mumtaz. Um, the stories, you see there's a pattern to the stories. Um, Mumtaz also was forced to watch her three children being murdered in front of her. She managed to escape with one surviving daughter, Rajia, who's seven. Um, and she was also um, beaten and attacked with a machete across her head and woke up in a burning house but managed to escape. You can see the burn marks on her arms here. Um, and Hasina who also survived the massacre at Tulotoli. Um, I'll read you what happened to her. Uh, the army forced Hasina and many other women to stand waist-deep in water and watch while soldiers dug a pit to burn the bodies of those they'd killed. She tried to hide her infant daughter under her shawl, but a soldier noticed the baby, snatched her away, and tossed her into the fire. Hours later, the soldiers took Hasina, her mother-in-law, sister-in-law, and three other relatives, all children, to a nearby house. The soldiers tried to rape the women, knifing the mother-in-law to death when she resisted and beating Hasina and her sister-in-law unconscious. They beat the young children to death with spades. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to find other words. Um, if you can just leave it there for a minute. I just want to thank you for sharing those. And, and for people who are interested, um, after the program, I can tell you how to get this report and the other Burma reports on the web. But I just want to reference that. Um, I want to stop because I think we do have one question, maybe more, before we switch gears into the change section, which Akshaya will speak to a little bit. But I think, do you have a question, Andrew? And if so, I want the microphone, Robin. Can you come up front? And if there's another question, we have time for a couple, maybe. But I think we have one here. Hi, sorry. I'm taking a question from Twitter. So uh, I'm Andrew Storline from Human Rights Watch. So Thank you. The question comes from a student at Warwick University in the UK, Keir Lawson, who asks about the advancements in satellite imagery kind of, um, in terms of quality, availability, maybe possibly video coming online. He's given a quote, that, uh, a link to a story about that. Um, does that increase? chances, I and mean, we have this new technology, but does that actually increase the chances that we'll get diplomatic action, that we'll get international action, that these people will get justice, or that people in the future will get more justice with more technology? I think that's a perfect segue into the Mike. change in advocacy, so, no, 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 it's, I, I, I think we should, we can, we, we can address that in the context of, uh, right. of of the actual work. Yeah. Why don't we hold on we, to that? Mm -hmm. we will. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important point. Yeah. Um, we definitely will address that question. And I saw a couple more hands. Robin, maybe you can come right here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing the portraits. My question is, how did you get the cooperation of these for these close-ups? 
and will there be any um, what's the English word for it? Um, Say it in Dutch and someone will translate. Oké, okay. sure. um, wat, wat krijgen ze ervoor terug dat ze zich hebben laten portretteren? So, what do people get in return for you taking their portraits? That's a great question. Second great. Now, um, thank you, Roland. And it also touches on um, there's something else important to bring up here as well, which I think is the <coughs> idea of consent. Um, to participate in, the, in, in this project, right? So, um, so we were walking through Kutupalong refugee camp. We, ha we went by foot. Uh, you saw Josh's picture, the satellite imagery of Kutupalong, so by foot. Um, a team of usually four, four or five of us. So there was me as the photographer, a videographer, one or two researchers who were conducting the interviews. Um, and then we had usually two translators um, one uh, translating, uh, one Bangladeshi translator, and then one Rohingya um, fixer or translator. So um, eventually how we found, if you like, the majority of um, these people were through community leaders who uh, so uh, often, often um, communities were located together inside the camp. So we would make contact with a community leader and explain what we were doing and that we wanted to interview people uh, and to take eyewitness testimonies and then we would be introduced to people. So at the point I stepped in was uh, typically after um, our, our sitters, uh, my sitters, my portrait sitters had been interviewed. Um, and so... Um, the Human Rights Watch researchers took um, great, went to great lengths to explain uh, why we were there, the, why we were collecting these interviews, um, these photographs, and often video, video interviews as well. Um, in most cases, um, uh, these, um, these first-person accounts were co collected from video interviews. So... Um, so we had to explain where, where we, had to, we had to get people's informed consent, not only their consent, but their informed consent, to explain that they were going to be used um, on the internet, in our reports, um, in the media also, um, what it meant uh, to, show, to show those pictures um, and to share their stories. In some instances, and we, we always reference that, some people's names have been changed. In some instances, we also concealed... There was one portrait of a young girl. You just see her eyes. We also concealed people's <coughs> identity. Um, so this wasn't um, this wasn't a conversation that I was necessarily always having. Although when I'm working on my own, that is something that I would be organising, right? Um, so this was a, com uh, a conversation that was taking place for the whole team. Um, and I have to admit, when I first arrived, I thought, no one's going to let me take their picture, are they? I mean, why would they? Um, and I, I was stunned that no one ever said no, actually. Um, and these were, they weren't simple conversations about, do you agree? Yes, let's get on with it. But um, actually it was, um, is it Khadija, the, the woman who, um, who, who has a bullet wound in her arm? Um, I, she was hit by the same bullet that killed her son. And um, this was a conversation that I had because I was alone with her when I photographed her. So um, she said, I, I tried to explain that it would be shown in lots of different places around the world. And she said, I don't care who you show. Show anybody, show, show the generals inside Burma what they're doing to us. And she told me a story about how when she was running through the rice paddy with her dead son in her arms, um, somebody from her community filmed her covered in blood and carrying his dead body on their mobile phone and then sent it to a new a TV station to be used on the news. And she said, she said, I was okay with that. Why wouldn't I be okay with this? So um, that's just one one example. But it is, yeah. What do they they get out of it? I mean, uh, maybe. Just, yeah, I I don't want to interrupt. No, no, okay. <laughs> but just there's so much to yes. say about no, no, this. I'm totally. sorry. It's and so I just I, I just will jump in because I think this also uh, speaks to moving to the idea of change and what we're advocating. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, what I will say, I want to emphasize two things <coughs> related to your question. One thing I want to be clear about is that Human Rights Watch has a very <coughs> um, specific protocols about consent and security. Um, I can speak about that after, but just to say that over the years, Human Rights Watch has elaborated and written very, very detailed protocols about how to approach subjects, take photos, take video, and obtain informed consent. And as you hear in this story, um, with the reference you gave to being filmed by a fellow community member, people are quite sophisticated in their understanding of these things, I've, I've found. The other thing I think is extremely important to emphasize, what do they get? It's a very good question. I've done many of these programs. We've covered many countries, Central African Republic, Syria, many others. What I want to emphasize for people, and some people in the room may have worked in the field, what people get time and time again when I worked in the field, what people say is what I think she was saying. They want justice. They want recognition. They want acknowledgement. So to share my story, I'm happy to do that because I know that is one of the few ways I might actually get justice. That's what people get. That's what people want. That is my conviction based on many experiences. It is more complicated that in some ways, but that is the core of what people have said over the years. I just want to... And particularly in the instance when a whole population is being wiped out or as it, people are attempting yeah. to wipe them out, the as idea a that they survived. Yeah. As someone who survived, this is my duty, I think, is what I've mm. experienced. But I just want to connect back to the question and then we're going to turn it over to Akshaya. I don't, I don't want to connect a couple points. So how do we put this material together to advocate and create change? because there will always be a counter narrative, a response from the government, an argument, a refusal. So how do we put together this technology? Is more technology more opportunity for justice? Are these images with the story a way to change people's hearts or compel the UN or whomever to action? So I want to sort of put us into that space. How do we use all these things? And thank you again, both of you, for presenting this material. And turning to our Zakshaya, how do we put all these images and pieces and stories together to present to those who are responsible, in power, authority, influential, to compel them to make change or accept the arguments that we're making? How, can you just speak? I know this is a big question once again, and I'm going to bring it back to the audience, but maybe you can just start to show us that package and how we do that. Yeah, and I see there's a question in the audience, so I'll, I'll speak to what you asked, and then we'll definitely come back to you. Uh, I think that we have really been centering on this question of what does human rights documentation do for people? And in some cases, the mere act of telling your story is important. Uh, for others, it's about the evidence, the fact that we are contributing to the historical record. Uh, but we as Human Rights Watch, we want to do more than that. We want to change the circumstances, uh, change the situation for these people. And we do that in multiple ways. Uh, in the case of the Rohingya community, I think that there's a very um, specific added value that we can bring, which is um, the credibility of our documentation to reinforce the veracity of what happened to them. And that's especially important because the Myanmar government, the military, absolutely denies all of this completely and on its face. They say, um, oh, Josh found that all of these villages were burned. Maybe the Rohingya burned them themselves. Uh, before we had the satellite imagery, they said, what burning? We don't see any burning. Um, you know, the Rohingya exaggerates. That's just what they do. And so for a community that has gone through that degree of dehumanization, that degree of denial, mm -hmm. the Burmese um, government, uh, the military, will not use the word Rohingya to refer to these people. For them, there's a true dignitary value in someone sitting down with them and saying, we care about what happened to you, and we want the world to know what happened to you. Um, and so that's why we deployed on an emergency basis to these camps. It was um, more than 
just our Burma researcher, we had our emergencies division involved, and then I went as an advocate because uh, one of the places that we think we could actually achieve change for this community in the long term is by shifting the United Nations response to this crisis. Uh, for too long, uh, and I think even until now, um, there has been a sense that uh, what's happening in Burma with the opening, whether it's the economic opening, the democratic opening, the freeing of Aung San Suu Kyi, um, and the shift away from years of military dictatorship is too important to jeopardize for anything. And I emphasize that because this story with the Rohingya, although it was clearly exacerbated at the end of last year following the August attacks, is not new at all. Uh, we embarked on a very similar exercise, including using Josh's satellite imagery, including doing testimonies in the camps in October 2016, when there was a smaller scale version of exactly the same story. And that particular example is a true tragedy because we saw all of this happen, these same patterns. Sexual violence was used as a weapon of war. We documented that. We counted villages being burned. There were uh, hundreds of thousands, uh, over 100,000 people who fled across the border in 2016. Uh, and we went to the UN and we complained about it. And people said, well, yes, uh, and I will remember this for the rest of my life. One senior UN official um, in the country, in Burma, said to me, well, that's a blip and we need to move on. We need to move on to the next phase because it's not productive to keep looking at the past. Uh, and, and that was the attitude that people had when we moved into this next phase. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it was about changing that narrative. And these facts were really important for that. Going there mm -hmm. ourselves to be able to speak to it on a personal basis was really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to confront the denialism was really important. Uh, a lot of the victims that we spoke to showed us the physical manifestations of the wounds that they had suffered, because they were so used to being uh, to being dismissed. They they would begin by showing, uh, as as we saw the woman who had the bullet in her arm. I spoke to her about how the bullet went through her son's body and then into her arm. And before she'd even talk about the true trauma of having lost her son, lost her uh, family members, lost her home, she started with the bullet because the bullet was the proof. Uh, and she's not wrong, because when we do the advocacy, when we go to diplomats, whether they're ambassadors in Rangoon or in New York or Geneva, they do ask questions that are at a certain level very cynical. They say, well, are the numbers inflated? How many people have actually see, been seen by a doctor? Where's the medical evidence? Uh, and so there is a degree of skepticism here that we are seeking to confront and change. And the reason we have to change it is because that's the only way we'll get concerted action to address this. Uh, and for us, that action involves um, accountability and justice. We want there to be documentation so that one day these victims can have their rights uh, in a court of law so that they can <coughs> accuse the perpetrators and there would be due process and hopefully there would be punishment for the crimes that were committed against them. But more than that, we also want uh, them to be able to return back so that the ethnic cleansing isn't successful. But they need to be able to return back in circumstances of safety, security, dignity, and um, an end to the discriminatory situation that they're living in. And that will require a real shift um, from the international community to be willing to pressure both the military and the civilian government in Myanmar. Uh, and we're having a tough time with it um, because so many are still torn by this issue with Aung San Suu Kyi, that's one. The other thing that makes it really tough for us is that the Chinese government, which has an influential role in the UN Security Council, they have a <coughs> permanent seat and a veto, they say that they don't want issues like this to be discussed because it's in their region and it's, 
internal question. It's an internal matter. And so that's why we are at a very basic level actually arguing why crimes like these are not internal matters. They're matters for everyone. They're matters for all of us. Because when crimes rise to a certain level, the very existence, the fact that something like this can happen with no consequence is a threat to international peace and security. It's a threat to all of us. Because if it can happen to this community uh, without any consequence, uh, then that sets a bad precedent uh, for everyone everywhere. And that's, those are the types of arguments that we have to make in order to try to achieve change. But it's an uphill battle because there are a lot of strong political and economic incentives on the other side, incentives that don't want to impose sanctions on the generals, even if they're responsible for these crimes, because they're also important partners geopolitically. Incentives that don't want to cut off arms flows to this military, even at this particular point in time, because there's a fear, well, if we don't sell them weapons, if we don't engage their military, then they might pivot towards the Chinese or the Russians. Uh, and the Myanmar authorities are very adept at playing off of those fears of the West to say, yeah, well, maybe we don't need you. Maybe we can go elsewhere. And that leads to a lot of self-censorship. And so part of our work is also pushing those who say with their words that they're committed to show that they're committed with action. Thank you. Uh, like actually I said, I think I know I think I saw one hand. I just want to give it back to the audience because we have about 15 minutes left for questions. and. At some point, I may circle back to Josh and Anastasia, kind of going to the question from Twitter about more technology, more justice. But I thought I had a couple more hands here. I just want to turn it back to the audience. Uh, there's one in the very back, Robin, and then I she see. She was in the front. We yes. said that we would go to her. Yeah, yeah, there and then in the back as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, just a quick question, um, perhaps for you, Josh. Appreciating the importance of the role of technology in justice, could you give us some indication of the sort of costs involved in obtaining this sort of imagery um, and the work that you're doing? Well, the, the costs um, are, are certainly substantial, uh, especially in cases when there's an, an obvious and compelling need for a sustained monitoring capability over a broad area. Um, it, it, at, a, at a commercial level, the, there's there's many different satellite providers, and and the, the 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 industry essentially has has revolutionized itself over the course of of a decade and a half, and so um, now it's there's a, a wealth of, of 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 data available basically, and so prices are are falling, um, but it's still it's it's can be quite a substantial burden financially for a small NGO. And so, yes, we do have a, 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 a procurement budget for the imagery, but it's very hard to, to, to manage these, these, these uh, unpredictable uh, events that could completely exhaust that budget uh, in, in a blink of an eye. Yeah. I think, uh, Robin, two in the back. I know in the very, very back, you've had your hand up. And I see you as well, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing all this. It's, um, it's very powerful and quite distressing also. Um, actually, I work for Doctors Without Borders um, and I've been quite involved on the Bangladesh and um, Myanmar situation uh, recently. I had one question for Anastasia. It's about uh, the consent of the pictures, but also the, um, the protection of the pe persons that you've interviewed because we've also done similar work and we've got quite a lot of uh, uh, people that reached out to us to retract their consent uh, because of fear of retaliation mm -hmm. and concerns mm -hmm. uh, and because we are quite present in the communities with um, clinics so i wanted to know also what are measures that you that human rights watch uh, takes in those moments to mitigate the risk for the people and uh, we can talk about it or so afterwards. And the, the second question, it's uh, related to the advocate part. Uh, the prospects are quite grim. I, I agree uh, with you. But I wanted to know what could we do uh, also by lever leveraging the, the diaspora, the, the Rohingya diaspora, and the, the countries in Southeast Asia be beyond China. 
Yeah, shall I take the first part? Um, yeah, it's, it's not a simple thing. There's no simple answer and it's something, I mean, I can speak personally as well, right? As a photographer, yeah. making pictures with someone, it's, it's sometimes hard to know what the right thing to do is to, to protect people. And um, so there are many people I photographed who are, whose pictures I'm not showing here, who, who had their testimonies taken, but who, um, who still had family inside Burma. So there was absolutely instances when we didn't show, uh, when we're not showing pictures of people. Um, uh, one thing, I mean, one of the issues, one of the many issues that came up is also uh, uh, reporting on rape, because rape has been used systematically um, by uniformed Burmese soldiers, um, but we haven't um, reported any specific cases. Um, internally, we know who, who has been raped and who hasn't, but those details do not accompany the captions that are used for external distribution. Mm -hmm. So there are different sort of levels of, um, or different ways that that information is, is shared. Sometimes identity has been concealed. Sometimes people weren't, I mean, there were many people who were interviewed who weren't photographed at all. Um, you know, the, another, another team who were at, well, that actually I was part of where I didn't accompany them and the videographer didn't accompany them at all. So there's sort of a whole different, there wasn't one blanket approach to everybody, but yep. these are the instances, if that makes sense, that we, um, yeah, we concluded that it was, the, it, it was the right thing to do. Um, in terms of people retracting their consent, that is a really great point. And um, I don't know, I mean, I don't know if there's anyone from Human Rights Watch working in the camps now. Certainly, that would be, I don't know if you, one of you guys want to respond to that. But yeah, that's, tri that's tricky. How would somebody contact me to tell me, oh, I don't want you to show my picture anymore. I've changed my mind. I don't, um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I can speak a little bit uh, more to, to the dynamics and, and, and the risk mitigation. Uh, because I, as Anastasia said, I was part of a group that did a separate report on sexual violence being used as a tool for the ethnic cleansing. And we took testimonials uh, and we took great lengths to um, give people a space to um, speak to us in confidentiality and even in a way that other members of their community wouldn't know that they were sharing. And so when we published information about sexual violence, we didn't do it with any real names uh, mm -hmm. or with any photographs accompanying uh, the stories because that was very important in the community. Uh, the, the other thing is that we had uh, some community members who ended up being resources for us, mm -hmm. as Anastasia said, who helped us navigate these um, dynamics. And they still remain there, and we remain in touch with them. So. Uh, Although we're not actively in the camps currently, we do get updates uh, about uh, the groups that we spoke to. But it is one of the challenges. Um, it's one of the differences between human rights documentation and advocacy work and what MSF <coughs> does, which is, uh, which is mm -hmm. presence and um, sustained presence in a place. Uh, it was one of the things that we were very clear with people about going to the question of what we're giving them. You know, We made it clear that whether or not you tell us that something happened to you, it's, it won't result in you getting any food or assistance or medical care. It's all just about what happened and acknowledging it and the story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that report, actually, I just noticed, is out on the front desk as you come in, the, the report on sexual violence as a pamphlet, mm -hmm. in case anybody's interested to see it. There's a stack of them there. Yeah. Great. I, I just wanted to just, just make one clarifying point about informed consent which is that that's the minimum basis upon which we would then use that material. So it's, it's, it's necessary, but it's insufficient. Mm -hmm. Because in many circumstances, um, especially when it comes in the context of social media and, and at the start of, of, a, of a war, it's very common for people to um, have a very poor uh, awareness about the overall risks that they may be exposed to in the process of sharing that social media with us. And in many circumstances, uh, uh, acutely in Syria and Iraq, where we have um, you know, repeatedly told people to stop 
sending us material and to stop sharing precisely because if we were able to georeference and locate the exact building where they were filming from, then the military can as well. And in, in those circumstances, we just won't use that material. And in, in, any, in any situation where obviously someone is able to, to, to provide us with a, a, an explicit request to, to redact or amend or generalize or simply to delete that testimony, then, then that, that is precisely what we would do. Yeah, um, and, and one last point, which is that, uh, as Anastasia mentioned, we are we were talking to people in the context of them having fled, and um, feeling like they were in a in a safer space than the one that they had been in, and all of these dynamics, I think, will be reopened um, in the eventuality that people actually start to go home, especially if the repatriation is not on a voluntary basis or it's forced. Uh, right now, there's a deal between Burma and Bangladesh where there's an idea that people should start going home uh, on the Myanmar side, on the Burma side, they've built reception centers that have barbed wires around them uh, where they say that they're going to process uh, 150 people a day to a max of 3,000 uh, per week. And this is something that is, is part of the discussion right now, which is how do you manage the idea that people certainly have a right to go home with the risks of pushing people back at a moment when there are people still fleeing. Uh, and so this is one of the advocacy points that we've actually been raising quite clearly. Um, and, and maybe it goes to the point of the diaspora, because the Rohingya community, um, and you, you would know from MSF because you've been present in the camps, have not fled just now in 2017, nor did they flee in the 2016 incident that I mentioned to you only. They've also fled in the past in 2012, and before that in 1992. Um, to these same camps. And so some of the people who we met with had never gone back. They had been there since 1992, um, and they were still refugees. Some people had gone uh, back and then were forced to flee again. Uh, so there's a repeat refugee circumstance, and we want to avoid that this time. I think we don't want to make the same mistakes of the past where there were <coughs> rushed repatriations where people were forced back, and the diaspora can speak to that more eloquently than anyone because they've actually felt that. Um, one of the women, she's very powerful, a really inspirational person who we met in the camps was one of these people who had fled in the 90s. And she was helping her community members escape uh, Rakhine State as we were there. Um, so it speaks to the resilience of the diaspora community as well. Uh, another young woman, uh, her name is Weiwei Nu. She's a public advocate for the Rohingya community. She has joined us in advocacy meetings in New York. Um, and she's also done advocacy meetings in Washington where she uh, benefits from the access and context that we as Human Rights Watch have. So she can speak on behalf of her own community about what they want. And she provides a different lens, a nuanced perspective about issues like the National Verification Card, which is a part of um, one of the demands from the Myanmar side that all of these people take these cards. And they don't want to take any card that says they're anything less than a citizen. And she, she's very eloquent about speaking about the risks of that. Um, to the broader South Asia issue, uh, one of the most um, complex dynamics is mobilizing other countries to stand up in solidarity for the Rohingya. They don't have any natural champions. Um, as I said, the West, uh, whether it's the European Union or the UK, can sometimes be too entangled with the dream of Aung San Suu Kyi to take a proactive role. And so we have been seeking alternative champions, and we've been looking um, to unusual allies. And one group that we saw and identified was the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, which is a broad um, multinational group of governments who all are Muslim countries. And one of the challenges of getting the OIC to do anything about this issue was that the regional states, um, some of them were very skeptical. Uh, but once those regional states got on board, we were able to mobilize with the OIC in New York 
to get a General Assembly resolution passed last year. And their effort at the beginning was actually opposed by the European Union. But once it got enough steam and momentum, um, by the time the votes came around, uh, all of the governments, the US, the UK, the EU, all joined in on this effort that was actually led by uh, some governments, of course, governments that we as Human Rights Watch document rights abuses inside their countries too. Uh, but we ended up partnering with them on this effort. Uh, and so it was Egypt and Turkey and Saudi Arabia that pushed this issue. Uh, but they couldn't have done it if the Indonesias and Malaysias and other regional states in Southeast Asia didn't um, sort of give them permission because there's a lot of deference. Sure. So those are some of the dynamics that we have to negotiate. And there are dynamics that we're going to continue to try to both exploit and negotiate to try to get change in the next coming months. Um, because one of the problems with crises like these is that they stay in the headlines uh, for a few weeks and then we move on to the next issue. But of course, in this case, I mean, these people are still suffering the effects of this ethnic cleansing. There are people who are still crossing the border. There are people who are still waiting on the riverbank because they can't pay the fee for the boatman or the raft to get across. So this is a very active crisis, and it's one that requires sustained attention. Uh, and we can't allow that natural sense of distraction or move on to the next big thing uh, to stop us from being able to achieve change. OK. I'm going to take one last question, and it's you, ma'am. Um, I do have to ask one favor as we wrap up the session with this last question. I just want to ask people as a favor to the next session. We do have to leave this room, so I'm sure people want to talk to our speakers, but we're going to take that outside to the corridor. And I can also tell people more about how to find the reports either out front or on our website, hrw.org. But I'm going to take your last question, and then we're going to wrap up. But please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your contribution uh, to this uh, master class. Um, I have a question uh, for Aksaya. Um, you mentioned the deal uh, between Burma and Bangladesh about a safe return. Um, but uh, can you uh, explain a little bit more about the deal? And um, the other question, what is, how do you see the, see the role of UNHCR in yeah, probably facilitating the safe return? <laughs> Yeah, great questions. Uh, so one of the problems is actually this, the role of UNHCR. Uh, Burma and Bangladesh, uh, or the government of Myanmar and the government of Bangladesh, negotiated this deal without including UNHCR. Uh, so they negotiated it bilaterally, and this is what they've done in past displacements. As I mentioned, uh, this cross-border issue with the refugee population has been uh, in some ways a quote unquote long standing one because there have been some refugees in Bangladesh from Burma for decades now. Uh, but this is the largest number that there have ever been. And so there was a lot of interest in sealing some kind of agreement from the Myanmar side that people would be able to go home. Uh, in Bangladesh, there's a sense, OK, well, we can host people, but for how long? Uh, and one of the tricky parts is that uh, for a very long time, Bangladesh was reluctant to call these people refugees because they know that once you call someone a refugee, you have obligations not to send them back. Uh, and so that is all part of the dynamic as well. Uh, and so one of the things that we as Human Rights Watch have been pushing is that in any deal, there needs to be a role for UNHCR, and there needs to be a role for some kind of independent monitoring of human rights um, on the ground in the situation where people go back. We've also been saying that people shouldn't be forced to go back to camps. They should be able to go back to where they came from, to their communities. Of course, that's hard to imagine, because as you saw in the pictures that Josh has produced, their homes are burned. Uh, the fields they used to farm have been harvested by Myanmar authorities. And all of the grain that they had yeah. sown, mm -hmm. that they thought was going to feed their families, has been taken and sold off. So their future livelihoods are also at risk. Mm -hmm. um, the government of Myanmar says that according to its own laws, land that is burned reverts to the state. Um, and so that is hugely problematic as well. We keep raising all of these dynamics to say that a return needs to be sustainable and safe. And you can't just push it through because um, Bangladesh is feeling the strain and the stretch. Uh, and so we continue to say that any returns 
can't happen until these circumstances are changed to make it more sustainable and likely that people would actually be able to be safe when they go back. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult issue, though, because for a lot of uh, folks, the idea that people would be stuck in Bangladesh forever is also really problematic because it means the people who conceived of this ethnic cleansing campaign basically win. Uh, and, and that puts us in a very tough position. So I'm sorry to say we have to stop here. However, if people want to continue, we can go out in the corridor and my speakers will go. Let me thank them, Josh, Anastasia. Actually, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. And um, like I said, don't forget your brochure. More exciting films and programs later today, including tonight at 8 o'clock and tomorrow. Thank you again so much. And we'll join you outside here in the hall.